All right, so now we're going to prove the intermediate value theorem for derivatives. And it's essentially the exact same statement as the intermediate value theorem that we already proved, except there's no reference to continuity here because the derivative is not necessarily continuous. So even though it might not be continuous, it still has the intermediate value property. Okay, that's, that's the content of the theorem here. So what's kind of interesting about this, well, I'll discuss it more in a bit, but it means that if the derivative is not continuous at a point, there's, it, there are, it cannot be discontinuous in a specific way, meaning like it can't jump value, okay? Because there are different types of discontinuities. So we've seen a couple different types of discontinuities, right? On one hand, there are discontinuities that are like, you know, a function is, you know, approaching some value from one side and then it just jumps randomly to some other value and then it approaches a different value from the other side, right? So those are called jump discontinuities. And then on the other hand, there's a different type of discontinuity that you could call essential discontinuities. And those are the types of discontinuities that involve like oscillation. So like sine of one over X, for example, if you define a value for that, you know, if you extend that function to zero in any way, um, to x equals zero, then it's still discontinuous at x equals zero, but it's not a jump discontinuity because there is no well-defined limit of the values of sine of one over x as x approaches zero because it oscillates, right? So that's called an essential singularity or an essential discontinuity. And uh, that is apparent, that, or that is um, according to this theorem, that's actually the only type of discontinuity that a derivative can have. So it's kind of interesting um, that, you know, this is true about derivatives. So let me state the theorem. <clears throat> so let f be differentiable on a b if a less than x one less than x two less than b and if C lies between F prime of X1 and F prime of X2, then there exists an X in X1, X2, such that F prime of X equals C, right? So C is the intermediate value here. It plays the role of Y in the intermediate value theorem from before. Uh, it's a value between the values of F prime at these two points. And the point is that there's a value, there's an X value in between those two points on the X axis where F prime actually achieves this intermediate value, okay? So um, here's the proof, all right. So um, all right, so let's uh, kind of transform the problem a bit. So um, assume that loss of generality. Again, this is kind of just by, by a, it's sort of a symmetry thing where it's like the argument, if this, you know, if we make this assumption the opposite way is basically the same, but you just flip some inequality. So let's assume that F prime of X1 is less than C less than F prime of X2. Okay, uh, so define g of x equals f of x minus cx on a, b. So this is a new function and we want to show that um, there exists an x in x1, x2, such that g prime of x equals zero, right? And we have that um, g prime of x1 is f prime of x1 minus c, which is less than zero. And g prime of x2 is f prime of x2 minus c, which is greater than zero, okay? So using this, what we're, what we're gonna show, so our strategy is this. Um, show 
G achieves, oops. A minimum on X one, X two at a point X naught in the open interval X one, X two. Okay, and that will that then X naught will be our desired value of X, right? Where G prime of X naught will be zero because it's a minimum. Uh, and here's the motivation for this. Okay, let me kind of draw a sketch. So we have, um, and I'm going to kind of outline the, the actual argument itself. So we have A and B, right? And then here's, uh, you know, X1, X2. And um, so we know that uh, G prime, or well, G, right? Okay, so G prime is negative at, at X1. Okay. So let's say G, the value of G itself is somewhere up here. And there's a sort of negative tangent line there. And then the value at G, uh, the value at X2, G prime at X2 is positive. And we don't know what, you know, who knows what the value of G is there. Um, but yeah, let's say that's the tangent line to the graph. So let's say, uh, hold on. Let me kind of try to Okay, so let's say that's the graph of G. Okay. So um, then, right, so clearly, like, here would be a minimum. But the point is, like, okay, all we have to show is that, like, we know G achieves some minimum value on this interval because it's close. It's a compact set, right? I mean, this is a closed bounded interval. Um, so G has to achieve some minimum. The only problem would be if the minimum was at X1 or at X2, right? That would be bad. But the point is that the fact that we know that, um, that the derivative here is negative and the derivative here is positive means that there are values just close, like just nearby X1, where G of X1 is actually less, or G of those values is less than G of X1. So G of X1 can't be the minimum because the derivative here is like negative, basically, right? And the, similarly with, with X2, the, the minimum on this interval, I'm saying, right? The, the minimum value of G on the closed interval from X1 to X2 can't be G of X2 because the derivative here is positive. So there are some values just over here where, um, where uh, G is smaller, right? So that's the gist of the argument. So like, the, you know, just to be clear, this argument would not work if G prime here was not negative and G prime here was not positive. So like, you know, you can have a function like, you know, something like that on a closed interval, right? Where the minimum is actually achieved at an endpoint and maybe it, it comes from, a, you know, restricting a function, you know, maybe there's a function defined, it's a function defined on a, on a bigger open interval, right? So it's actually differentiable at this endpoint of this interval, right? I mean, it is differentiable here and the derivative is positive, but the, the minimum on this interval is still uh, at this endpoint, even though the derivative isn't zero. And that's because, right, uh, that's because um, the derivative here is positive. So it's possible for it to be the minimum, basically, is what I'm saying. So it's really specifically the fact that the derivative here is negative and the derivative here is positive that lets us find a minimum in between. And just to like kind of really uh, drive this home, if we wanted to treat, see, we're assuming that f prime of x1 is less than c less than f prime of x2. The other case we might have to consider, or the other case we would have to consider if we didn't just assume this without loss of generality, uh, the other case we would consider would be f prime of x1 greater than c greater than f prime of x2. If that was the case, then when we took, when we form g, we would find that g prime of x1 would be uh, positive and g prime of x2 would be negative. And so then we would actually be able to find a maximum, not a minimum in between. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of the structure of this argument is that it really hinges on the specific uh, assumptions about the derivatives here and here. Okay. So, um, right. So let's, let's actually 
make the proof or let's uh i mean i kind of already started the proof but let me let me let's finish off the proof okay so um since g is continuous on x1 x2 it achieves a minimal value on uh at some x naught x1 x2 um since g prime of x1 is negative uh there exists a delta such that for um for x in uh you know x1 minus delta x1 plus delta uh, we have that the divided difference um, so g of x minus g of x1 over x minus x1 uh, min uh, minus um, well let's see Uh, minus, uh, well, let's say, let's say, yeah, yeah, yeah. minus um, g prime of x1 is, uh, you know, less than, less than, let's say, absolute value of g prime of x1 over 2, right? So then, or well, okay, now I'm going to just, uh, say it this way, that this is less than zero, right? Uh, so for, for, so, so for, I mean, this is the same argument I made. This is the same argument we made in Rolle's theorem. Okay. Just to be clear, like this is the exact same, same reasoning that we used in Rolle's theorem, right? About how like nearby, nearby uh, the point where we're taking the derivative, these difference quotients have to have the same sign as the derivative. So for, so, but if X is between X1, yeah. So X1 less than X less than X1 plus Delta. Um, you know, if X1 is less than X, then the denominator here is positive. So in order for this to be negative, the numerator would have to be negative. So G of X is less than G of X1. So g of x1 is not the minimal value, meaning x0 is not equal to x1. A similar, okay, a similar argument shows that x0 is not equal to x2. So x0 is in the open interval x1, x2. And since Oops. Uh, since g of x naught is minimal, g prime of x naught is zero, so f prime of x naught is c. Completing the proof of the intermediate value theorem for derivatives. Okay. So uh, yeah, basically, I would say this picture kind of sums it up. You know, that you know here's x naught. Uh, you know, if, if the derivative here is negative and the derivative here is positive, there has to be a minimum somewhere strictly in between these two points, not at either one of them, but somewhere strictly in between. And the derivative there has to be zero. So that's basically it. Uh, so that's the intermediate value theorem for derivatives. And in the next and final section of this lecture, uh, we'll look at how to compute derivatives of inverse functions.